And so, Lord, I just pray for each and every one of us today, Lord, that we would just receive the truth about who you are and who we are in you. Lord, if we could just grasp that, we would walk in victory and your kingdom would advance. And so, Lord, I confess I often have doubts and I don't believe or the, the, the realities of this world and the troubles of this world become a distraction. And so, Lord, I pray today that each and every one of us will be renewed and revived and awakened and given a greater measure of faith than we had before we walked through these doors. Holy Spirit, have your way. May you be glorified and may you be honored today. In Jesus' name, amen. So one of my um, most favorite things to do on the weekends is I get to listen to the lecture. <laughs> and I'm so grateful for technology that it's posted and I can, I can hear and it helps me feel like I'm a little part of what's going on here. And I really appreciated last week's lecture that Linda had. Um, and I want to just say thank you, Linda, because one thing that you have deposited in my heart through the Holy Spirit is this, this hunger and desire to know God who he is as a person. Does that make sense? And um, I have just been on this uh, pursuit to know him in that way. And I love that because it's just amazing. And the other thing that Linda has taught me is um, who am I in light of who he is? And so um, if I just kind of focus on those two, those two things, it's empowering in a very powerful, powerful way. And so um, I believe with all my heart that if the enemy could distort who God is, and he's done a really good job, and then if he could destroy our identity, he's got us. Would you agree? Look at our culture. We've distorted God, and we've lost our identity, the very thing that makes us who we are in his image, right? And so what I hope today is that if anybody in this room is walking in defeat, and that's one observation that I've had either in my past life as a, as a walking Christian, walking this out, is we're not meant to walk in defeat. We're meant to walk in victory. And I believe with all my heart, the way to do that is to really know who he is and believe what he has said about who he is and who we are in him. May that be so, okay? So anyways, that's my heart. So anyways, with that said, I think that in the book of Ezra, we get an opportunity to discover what is really important to God and, and, and about his character. And what was really interesting in the book of Ezra, six times it talks about the hand of the Lord. So anytime you guys are recognized, oh, nice shirt. Um, anytime we um, uh, see repetitive phrases or words, um, I've learned in studying the Bible, that's something to pay attention to. God is wanting to get our attention. So the hand of the Lord, we're going to talk about the hand of the Lord today. But even more fascinating, at least in my version, which is the New King James, and I love all versions, so I'm not particular to one kind, but when I study, I like the New King James. 26 times in the book of Ezra, what is the key phrase? Does anybody know? House of the Lord. House of God. Do you think that's important to him? Very important to him. Extremely important to him. So I just was perked up. I'm like, Lord, I want to know you. I want to know this God that, his hand, that he has a hand, right? So good. Um, as we spend our time together this morning, I want you to be thinking in the back of your mind, 1 Corinthians 3.16, that says, do you not know that you are a temple, Right? You are the house of God, okay? And the Spirit of God dwells in you. So even though Ezra, and in that time, right, under this particular section, Zerubbabel has got his group of people, and they're, they're building the house of God, right? We are the house of God. So kind of think about those in those two terms. I loved this scripture. It says, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. So it doesn't matter who's king, doesn't matter who's president, doesn't matter who the leaders are. They are just putty in the Lord's hands. It's just water. He directs them. So there's nothing. He's not out there going, oh my gosh, look who's the president. Or oh my gosh, look what's happening in the world. He's the one that has directed all of that. And I love that. It gives me assurance. 
right? So what is God's hand? God's hand of power. And it's so fascinating. If you're interested in doing a word search just on the hand of the Lord, there's so much we can learn. And unfortunately, I can't share everything with you, but I just encourage you, if this is something that you find intriguing, as I did, you will be super blessed if you look up all the references to his hand. So Yod, I think I'm saying that right, is in the Hebrew, and it means power, might, mighty, control, possession, God's power to do whatever he wishes. That is your first blank. Nothing, nothing, nothing can withstand his hand. Not our sin, not the enemy, not the force of nature. We see that with Jesus. He was able to just speak and calm the storm. The forces of darkness, there's absolutely nothing that can withstand his hand. That's our God. That's the one we serve. So his hand may be heavy. You might see those references, which means weighty. And it can mean both ways. It can mean like just this weight or this burden. Have you ever felt that kind of heaviness from the Lord? That's his hand. It also means a, a place of honor and glory. So have you ever been in a worship service and you're like, you feel the heavy weight of his glory? That's his hand. I love that. His handy hand also empowers, it blesses, it protects, it delivers, it dispenses judgment, and it dispenses mercy. I love that. So I was thinking about this, and maybe you guys can help me with this as well. What does our hands do? What is the function of our hand? Because obviously this is a, a picture of God. It's not like he actually has human hands, although Jesus does. But He's trying to tell us something about his personhood by using the reference of a hand. So what, does it, what do our hands do? They work. Create. The, what? Feed. Snack, is that what you said? Oh, okay. Okay, discipline, I'll go with that. What? Caress or touch. Yeah. Anything else? Assist or help. Our hands are really high functioning, super high functioning. What cool design is our hand? When I looked up kind of the function of the hand, kind of from a, a, a biological, it has the innate ability to grab hold and to release. And that gave me a picture of this God that we serve. He's able to hold and he's able to release. And I love that. So just something to think about. Um, God's hand fulfilled prophecy by causing King Cyrus to allow the Jews to return and rebuild the temple. So I, I just find this fascinating that this king who has conquered this nation actually kings before him, has conquered this nation, right, of Israel or Judah, if you will. And all of a sudden, God just provokes him to release them and to rebuild their country. And I thought, how fascinating. Has that ever happened in history? I couldn't find a single time that that had happened in history. You think of some releases of captured people and those, there's usually a war involved. No war. Just King Cyrus just says, let my people go. Let those people go, right? And not only that, go and rebuild your country and build your worship. That is the hand of God. It's a miracle. It's just unheard of. Then I was thinking about in our modern day, what is something that has happened that seemed impossible, like out of the ordinary? Israel, for sure. Absolutely. The whole nation. It's just so amazing that all these things have happened um, as, nation, as God has allowed that nation to prosper again, rebuild again. What's that? Came back in a day, yeah. And, they're, and God's still with them, and he's still prospering them and protecting them and hopefully bringing them back, right? But I was thinking about Roe v. Wade. I never thought in my lifetime that that would ever get reversed. To me, that's the hand of God. 
And then I don't know if you guys know this, you probably do, but they just had the March of Life. Uh, I got the date here. Where is it? Uh, on March 9th or January 19th, Friday. Was it Saturday? Okay. So they've been doing that for 50 years, ever since Roe v. Wade. And I thought, how interesting. And then they go, they march and they get to the Supreme Court and they pray at the Supreme Court. And I just thought, all of those prayers have been lifted up and God's hand moved and it was overturned. Please continue to pray. I just think that's amazing. God's hand caused the kings, and there was more than one king in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, to show favor by abundantly providing resources and authority to rebuild. Where God guides, God provides. I love that phrase. So clearly this is the will of God. There's no doubt about it. He's got favor all over it. I was thinking about Philippians 4.19, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We do not come from a place of lack or scarcity, right? As the people of God, we have a God that lavishes upon us all that we need. It may not be what we want, but it's all that we need. Love that. So again, God moving hearts of the kings to oh, let's just take the treasures that we stole from the temple and we're going to go ahead and let you guys take it back. Plus all the livestock you need and the gold and the silver and all the things that you need. It's just a miracle. It's just amazing. It reminded me of the Exodus story. Same thing. The Egyptians just were compelled to just give them all their riches and here you go. It's like, who does that? The hand of the Lord does that. I love that. So cool. The next one, God's hand moves the people to the land, worship is established, and the building of God's house is started. So who can tell me how many years ago were the people held captive and the exiles were brought to Babylon? How many years ago was that? <coughs> 70 years, okay. So what I was thinking about, if you did the math, the people that are coming back are probably their children and grandchildren. Right? Very fascinating. I love that. So I was thinking about that. If you grew up in a land, say Babylon, your friends were there, your favorite grocery store was there, right? Your favorite market, places that you like to go, your favorite places to eat, your favorite activities, your synagogue, whatever it is, right? Was your very established and very rooted. How hard would it be for them to uproot? and move all the way back to a land they really only heard about. And I know some of you have moved from faraway places to be here, and you could testify how painful that was, and how hard that was, and how uncomfortable that was to be uprooted and moved to a land, right? Um, my husband often will joke with me and say, Let, let's move to blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I think about how rooted our family is here. I can't imagine. It puts me into a panic. So I can't even, um, I, I just can't, I'm trying to put myself in these children and grandchildren. And yet God's hand moved them. They probably didn't want to, but they did it. And I love that. So cool. So I was thinking about Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. And you're welcome to go there if you'd like. But I can read it to you. And this is what it reminds me of, of God moving his people. So then you are no longer strangers and foreigners. So they were strangers and foreigners in Babylon, right? Which now became Persia, because Persia took over, okay? But you are fellow citizens with the saints and of God's household, having been built on the foundation. Did Ezra build a foundation? In the book of Ezra, Zerubbabel did it, right? Which is just like all the, the same wording has just really captivated me built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Just love the parallel there. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, right? We're building the house of God into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. So I love that there's the kind of the foreshadowing of what was to come and I see that so much in 
in what we're reading in our lessons. So it's really cool. All right. So another way that we see God's hand move is the God's hand of encouragement. Okay. So the first blank after encouragement is discouragement because you can't be encouraged unless you're discouraged, right? <laughs> so discouragement from the opposition sets in among God's people and the building of the house of God stops for 16 years. Was it God's will? Was it clear that the plan and purpose for his God's people was to build his house? Do you think he established that? Clearly gave them provision, provided a way. They had everything to move forward in his provision and in his purpose. And yet discouragement sets in and they stop. Has discouragement stopped you from fulfilling your purpose? The enemy would love nothing more than to have his people, God's people, stopped in building the house. This one's one of my favorite sayings. The enemy uses smoke and mirrors to distract and discourage the people from their purpose. When there's accusation, when there's trouble, when there's persecution, when there's evil that seems to just go rampant around us, it's a distraction from our purpose. And we can so often, I can so often, start to put my eyes on what's wrong, right? What's not going well, and I'll stop in my tracks and the enemy now goes, aha. Her eyes are no longer on me. They're on the smoke and mirrors because it is, it's just acting. It's not real at all. Okay, I'm not saying the enemy doesn't have power, but not with a believer. He does not. He does not. Okay, it's all smoke and mirrors. The tactics the enemy uses to distract the people of God from advancing the kingdom. I want to show you what those tactics are in Haggai chapter 1. So I know that we're going to be looking at Haggai in the future, so I'm stealing it, Linda. Sorry for a little bit for this, because it definitely is um, relevant to our study. So if you guys want to go to Haggai, if I can find Haggai, I'd really encourage you to go there. It's after Zephaniah. It's on page what? <laughs> It's what? Fourth to the last book, if that's helpful. <laughs> you know what? I really appreciate this study. Do you guys feel like we're getting a good survey? Oh my gosh, it is fabulous. I'm like, man, we're just so spoiled. Nothing new under the sun is right. So good. All right, are you guys there? Journey with me. Okay, and be thinking about the smoke and mirrors. Okay, thinking about the enemy's tactic. And see what God does. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and, the, and, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozak, sorry, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Okay, so tuck that away. This is what the people are saying. Like, it's not time to build, the, to build God's house. It's not time. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you to yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring little. You eat but do not have enough. You drink, you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earn wages to put into the bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I, have, that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. 
You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? Says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore, the heavy heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. Now I have, excuse me, for I have called for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and the oil, and whatever the ground brings forth on men and livestock, and all the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, the son of and Joshua, the son of the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the high priest and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. Let's look what we learn. The tactics of the enemy is first trouble and frustration. And we find this, this exact wording in Ezra 4.4. 4. So it's a good way for us to get distracted when we're finding ourselves when the, the times are troublesome or we're feeling frustration. I'm learning to go, ding, 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 ding. Is that a smoke and mirror? The second thing is that, as we learned in Haggai, is that there was selfish indulgence. They're only worried about me, making sure my money bags are filled, making sure my house is right. And God said it was like putting money into a bag with holes. It's empty. When we seek ourselves, it's empty. The world is empty. But yet the enemy loves to tell us that's where our security is, right? Smoke and mirrors once again, and our eyes are shifted off. Misplaced priorities. They took care of themselves over the house of the Lord. Although God gave them a very clear calling and a purpose. This one's my favorite because I feel so guilty when I do it myself. It's spiritualizing. Great tactic of the enemy. It is not God's timing. Have you ever heard that one? <laughs> it's just not God's time. Although he's made it very clear there was a call and purpose. Right? So just let you know, we can spiritualize our way out of anything. And then lastly, we have an indifference to God's house. We in America have a very consumer mindset when it comes to the house of God. We're very indifferent, right? We either like the worship or we don't. We like the teaching or we don't. We could put a little Yelp review on what we experience at church, right? We're indifferent. We're very indifferent. I'm indifferent. I'll be the first. By God's hand... So we know what's going to distract us. We know the tactics. We know the smoke and mirrors. By God's hand, he sends messengers. Hallelujah. Haggai and Zechariah to encourage the people by the word of the Lord. That's why it's so important for us to assemble together, right? Because those smoke and mirrors are there and it can get us disoriented. We could lose our focus. We can get distracted. And then Sheree comes along. And the Spirit of God is in her, and she's a messenger from the Lord, and she brings us the word. And now we're encouraged. And then guess what? Then I come, and I can come over here, right? And you guys have some struggles and smoke and mirrors and all the things that are going on. I'm like, remember the truth. This is who God is. This is what he says about you. And now you're encouraged. And it goes on and on. What a privilege that we have. That's why we need each other. Through Zerubbabel and Yeshua's, or Joshua's leadership, the people rise and begin to build the house of God. Isn't that great? Well, you know when true encouragement has come because we rise and we go. We rise and we build. And we know that we're back on track. And the distraction is now at bay. The prophets continued, and this is really cool, to provide encouragement by being with them and helping, Ezra 5, 2. 
Did you guys notice that today in your lesson? The prophets didn't just speak a word and out they go, the back door. No, a true encourager, a true prophet of the Lord is going to be in your midst. It's going to be your helper. Love that. Oftentimes we're like, we're quick to share words. We're out. No, we're often called to walk alongside others and journey with them because we hold the very presence of God inside of us and we can help. What an encouragement that is. I know many of you have walked along other people's lives or they've walked along your life to encourage you. They just didn't dump a word on you and leave. I love that. Okay. The other thing that caught my eye about God and who he is, God's hand stirs up the spirit. Ever since I've discovered this, I've been praying. This has been a part of my prayer life. Lord, stir up the spirit in Susan. Stir up the spirit in my children. Stir up the spirit in my pastor. So powerful. So the Hebrew word is er, and it means to rouse, awaken, excite, raise up, open eyes. I was thinking about when you stir up somebody from slumber, how do you do it? You shake them with what? Your hands, right? And guess what? They open their eyes. And that's what made me think of this. I'm like, that's the same thing that the hand of the Lord is. Wakes us up, rouses us, stirs our spirit. And we're like, oh gosh, okay, back on track. Back on track. I love that. Isaiah tells us that the Lord awakens the prophet's ear to hear God's message. So we see the hand of the Lord working in Haggai and Zephaniah, or Zechariah. Sorry, I think I might have my prophets messed up. Zechariah, thank you. <laughs> so he stirs their spirit and awakens their ears so they can hear the message. That's what we need. We can read and listen, but unless the Spirit of God is cultivating that word, it just kind of doesn't really connect. The arm of the Lord, so what's attached to the arm? The hand. Awakens or roused into action. And you guys talked about that, that our hands are meant for work, creativity, and action. This is another way that we see it. When you look up that word er, it also talks about, uh, say, somebody who's a violinist warming up. It's that same stirring up the music, getting ready to play. And that's what the Lord is doing when he's stirring us up. He's just like, all right, anticipation. We're going to play a song. It's going to be great. God stirs up the spirit of the leaders and the people, which revives them to return to the building of God's house. That's Haggai 1.14. God stirs up the spirit of the leaders and the people, which revives them to return to the building of God's house. You know, with all the doom and gloom in the world, God is at work in such powerful ways. And if you'll indulge me, um, I don't know if you guys are aware, there's revival sweeping through the nation. You don't really hear much about it, but it's, it's happening. And if you'll allow me, I want to read a little bit about what happened um, about this time last year. And it's still continuing. This, uh, sorry, let me tell you where this comes from. The title of this is Christian Revivals Are Sweeping the Country. Here's How to Spread the Flame. Okay. And it's talking about Asbury University, if you haven't heard of, heard of that awakening is what they're calling it. So there's always uh, prayer and fasting before all of these kinds of revivals happen. And so um, I know the, the church that um, I love to worship at, we're, we've been in a prayer and fasting time for a month because they, we really want the Lord to speak to us and to move and we want to be part of that. And anyways, I just, just love that. In the summer of 2019, my friend Malachi O'Brien called me and said, I feel like we're supposed to call one million young people to fast and pray as we enter the roaring 20s. 
We had the sense that the 2020s would be time when God would do something significant and powerful in America. Little did we know what was coming. So let me ask you a question before I read further. I also read another article of what characterized Gen X and Gen, no, no, I'm sorry, Y and Z, the millennials and then the next generation. What do you think they described this gen that generation? How did they describe them? Yeah. Crazy. Lost. Selfish. Narcissist. Self-indulgent. Entitled. So these are some pretty strong labels that we as a culture have placed on our young people. But God. But God. The hand of the Lord. We shared the invitation to fast, fast and pray, and in January 2020, churches across the country joined us. We had no idea the chaos, difficulty, and pain that was about to sweep the world, but fasting and praying was the great way to prepare, prepare for what was ahead. The censorship of big tech, the gaslighting of mainstream media, and the tyranny, tyranny of big government over the last few years have been intense. This has woken many people up and caused many Christians to be desperate for God to do something. People are desperate for the corrupt elite to face any semblance of justice. People are broken, tired, weary of the woke attack on American values. There's an urgency in the air for God to do something, to stir something up in our country. And that spiritual desperation is clearly being met this year, 2023. On February 8, 2023, a minister in Kentucky was preaching at the chapel at Asbury, Asbury University when something unusual and extraordinary happened. It started with a handful of students who didn't want to leave after the service was over. They sensed that they should keep praying. For the next few hours, more students filled the chapel and this snowballed into a 24-hour service that lasted 16 days. More than 200,000 people converged on the small town of Wilmore, Kentucky, a town of just 6,000. There was no desire for publicity, no famous Christian speaker or band. The only draw was the unusual, strong presence of God. What was it like to be in the room, question mark? That's what we need, ladies. Just the purity of his presence. We don't have to have speakers and publicity and all the things that we think will draw. Only his presence will draw his people. I just love this. The question was answered. It felt peaceful. We need peace and rest right now, especially Gen Z who feel anxious and carry so much pressure. The presence of God was intense and gentle at the same time. It drew us into repentance, worship, intimacy with God, and community with each other. I was moved by the testimonies of people being free from suicidal ideation. Many men shared stories of sexual abuse, which is unusual because men often hide because of shame or tensions around sexuality. Many testimonies people shared during this time are rooted in our affections being realigned and eclipsed by Jesus. Mr. Amir Cribs shared stories of people who traveled for hours and from countries around the world to take part in the revival. Most waited in line for hours to spend a few minutes in prayer, all because they recognized the sacred work God was doing. His hand was moving. There is no explanation for something like this. The spiritual clamor spread from Asbury to 37 other college campuses across the country that allowed young people to experience spiritual freedom, renewal, and calling their purpose. There has been more than 200 teams of students testifying about the revival in churches since then, with hundreds more going out this summer. A little bit more. What happened in Asbury is only one example of the revival that is sweeping the nation. Pastor Robbie in Tennessee grew restless from the pressures of ministry in 2020. He dedicated his time on his porch to silent prayer for almost a year. 
Then he sensed God leading him to call for a spontaneous baptism at his church. That was the highest unusual concept with the way he normally did ministry, but he sensed God, uh, sensed it was God, so he did it. Over the next year, revival swept the church with more than 1,500 people expressing their faith through public baptism. In total, 4,166 people were baptized at one time. I don't know if you, if your church talks about baptisms, I have listened and heard the baptisms are exponentially increasing. I don't know about you guys, that is the hand of God. We desperately need revival. I was talking to a, a, an elderly gentleman on our, in our kitchen at the UGM, um, just a, an old saint who loves the Lord but has strong opinions. <laughs> you want to listen to them. <laughs> And he says, you know, I, I anticipate the Lord coming any day. But he says, but I can't help but sense there's going to be one more ginormous revival. And I don't know about you, that excites me because I have kids and grandkids that need to be revived. Let's pray it in to sow. God's hand will move. He wants to move. I'm super excited about that. When times are difficult and the news is often negative, let's share positive stories. Giving God glory, it's contagious. Let these revivals remind us that God is not silent and inactive in our world. He responds to people of faith. He moves in mighty ways when we pray to him. He hears our cries for help. And he cares about this generation just like he did for past generations. Be encouraged. Renew your passion for God. Pray fervently and spread the good stories of what he is doing. That is how we spread the flame of revival. What do you think? Excited? Let me see if there's anyone in this one. This one's from Christian Broadcast Network. Oh, this got me, guys. This is, again, talking about the Asbury. And no matter where it goes from here, it's undeniable that this generation is full of souls who hunger and thirst for Jesus, and they will be filled. Gen Z has been marred as the generation of anxiety, depression, and suicide. Would you not agree? A number of students spoke directly during Thursday night's national event about their struggles with these issues, telling of the new measures of freedom and the hope they found that Jesus is changing them from the inside out and they no longer need to let these struggles define who they are. It was genuine, and it was powerful. 350 hours of continual praise, worship, and prayer. When's the last time you didn't want to leave the worship? Or was your, your tummy rumbling because you were hungry and you couldn't wait to get out of there? Oh, Lord, stir us up. Stir our spirit that we cannot get enough of who he is. And all we want to do is worship and pray and encourage. Sounds a little bit like heaven to me. Love that. All right. The other way I want to share that I learned about the hand of the Lord is God's right hand. So I, I would like to do a little bit of an experiment, if you guys don't mind. It could turn into a complete flop. I have no idea. But it's something that I've been meditating on for quite some time and I'm still trying to get my brain wrapped around it. So we'll see what the Holy Spirit does. Could I get three volunteers, please? You won't have to speak, I promise. Cherie, Penny, and Susan. Okay. Please come up here. <clears throat> you can see that there's three chairs. See what you do. Get a drink of water. Mm. I'm sorry, I wasn't very specific. Please don't sit yet. Don't sit yet. I'm sorry. Don't sit. Don't sit. Okay. In fact, could you kind of go over here a little bit? Thank you. Okay, you're God. Oh boy. Oh, let me stand over here. You're you're Jesus. Oh wow. And you're Penny. Okay. All right. When I read this scripture, whichever one of you it pertains to, I want you to sit down. So, Sheree, I'm going to have you actually sit in this chair right here. So there's God. Go ahead. Yep. All right. I told you it was an experiment. 
I didn't even, I haven't even practiced this at home. This will be really interesting. Okay. You ready? Ephesians 1, 19, 21. I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand. In the heavenly realms, now he is far above any ruler, authority, or power, or leader, or anything else, not only in this world, but the world to come. So Jesus Christ raised from the dead, and now he seated where? The right hand of the Father. Does that seem right? Does everybody look, that look okay? Okay. All right. Isaiah, I don't have this on your notes, but Isaiah 41.10, you're welcome to put this down. God will hold Penny with his right hand. Okay. Now this is the puzzle. Psalm 73, 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. Is that, which hand is Penny hold? I wonder if Penny should move. <laughs> oh, where's your right hand? <laughs> okay, you may sit down. Thank you for that. My experiment worked. I'm so happy. Okay, so I probably should help you fill in the blanks. God's right hand, got that. Hold me by my right hand. So that's what threw me. I'm like, if I'm on the right, then my right hand's over here. It's not hanging down to anybody. But he says that he holds my right hand. So then I'm like, well, I must be in the middle. Squished between the Father and the Son. And what resides in me? Oh, the Holy Spirit. And I just got a glimpse of the Trinity. So if you indulge me, you see you've got these little, sorry, it's a very bad Ben, ben diagram. So I want you to put in a symbol. God, the Father, is a triangle. I learned that from uh, K. Arthur, <laughs> right? He's the so put him on the circle that would be to where the sun would come to the right of him. And you can either have the circles facing out or first facing towards you. So if I'm choosing to make the, the circles face toward me, if I put God the Father here, then his right would be this way. And then I'm going to use a cross to indicate Jesus. Clear as mud? So triangle here, cross here. And now you can put yourself in the middle. You can make your little stick person, little heart, whatever you want. I probably should have done that. Does that make sense? Okay. So I'm going to put God the Father here, and he's going to be a triangle representing the Trinity. Has anybody ever done a K. Arthur study? You know, you know. And then the cross is Jesus because he's on the right side. He's seated on the right side of the Father, right? Scripture is very clear about that. And now God holds us by our right hand. So we would be in the middle. Nice and snug. So with that said, I love this last verse, Psalm 27, 5. For in the day of trouble, smoke and mirrors, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. There he is, God's house. It's his dwelling, it's his home. He will hide me. Nothing can touch you. If the Father and the Son are right, squishing you in the middle, you're pretty darn secure, right? In the secret place of his tent, and he will lift me up on a rock. The evil one cannot touch you. You and I are victorious. Because the hand of the Lord is strong and mighty, and he values his house, and we are his house. Let's pray. Lord, you are amazing, and I thank you that that power you have decided to put into clay jars such as ourselves. And Lord, help us to fully believe with the fullness of faith of who we are in you more than conquerors. We do not walk in defeat. 
we are yours and you are ours and that you keep us and hold us close by the power of your right hand and you clench our right hands and we are secure in you may we march forth even when the storms are around us and trouble and frustration may we continue to keep our eyes solid upon you and just keep marching forward doing what you have called us to do. The time is short, and Lord, we ask for a revival, especially among our children and grandchildren. Return them to what their foundation once was. May they come back. May they rebuild. And may they be infectious for such a time as this. In your name, amen.